Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Cassie, I use she, her pronouns and I am hub coordinator for the Sunrise Franklin Hub down here just a little bit south of Nashville in Tennessee. And today we're gonna to be hearing from Marquita Bradshaw who is running for Senate here in Tennessee as well as do a Q&A with her just to, and so if you have any questions, Make sure to drop those in the chat or you can comment or reply depending on where you're watching from because we're live streaming to folks. And so, yeah. So, but before we hear from Marquita, I want to take a second to talk about why it is so important for us to elect a Green New Deal champion um, to the Senate here in Tennessee and to elect Green New Deal champions to everyone. Um, so why we need to flip the Senate. I personally could not be more excited to have Marquita Bradshaw at the top of our ticket here in Tennessee. In the years that I've been organizing here, I honestly didn't know if I'd ever see a progressive working class environmental activist at the top of our state ticket. Marquita represents the people. She understands how all forms of justice intersect because she and her family have been affected by these interlocking problems of inequity. And we need more people with lived experiences like hers um, at all levels of power. The people need Marquita in office and we need to help get her there. So it's no question that we need to get Trump out of the White House. But what we can't forget is that it's so crucial that we are flipping the Senate and getting progressive community leaders into office like Marquita. Red states like Tennessee have been written off and deemed untouchable for progressive candidates and ideas. But the fact is that progressive values like the Green New Deal and Medicare for All can win in red states. They can win in the South and they can win right here in Tennessee. But just because we know that we can win, that doesn't mean that it's gonna be easy. We need to be putting in the work in these tough races and working to flip the district, which also means flipping the Senate. We're up against people with a lot of power and a lot of money, but what they don't have is us. They don't have young people on their side. Young people have always been at the forefront of movements, of movements fighting for change, and that's because we hold the real power. When we come together and organize, we can get our candidates elected and win a Green New Deal. And that's why we know that we can flip the Senate by electing people like Marquita Bradshaw. When we flip the Senate, we'll be able to usher in the era of the Green New Deal and create lasting political change that we so desperately need. By flipping the Senate, we'll be able to change the landscape in which we organize. There are several Democrats that we still need to get um, to our side that are currently in office, but by making sure that the Senate turns blue, we won't have to fight to hold on to what we barely have now, and we'll be able to work on moving forward as a society. And I fully believe that having Marquita by our side, um, we as young people can work together to flip the Senate and win a Green New Deal. And now I would love to pass it off for the reason why you all are here, um, to, for the person uh, that you all wanna see um, and hear speak, um, Marquita herself, and then we'll do some questions right afterwards. So I'm gonna pass it off to Marqu Marquita and welcome. Welcome Marquita. Thank you for having me. Um, I, I have the uh, Sunrise poster that was made in Knoxville uh, in my home office. It's so cute. It's, it has Marquita with the pearls and um, and the glasses. I think it's iconic um, to be uh, have so many symbols that represent uh, change and and also just working people. I to simply put it, I grew up in a neighborhood where everything was in walking distance that was once thriving, and we had a national priority list super fun site. Um, down the street from our house. The chemicals there were made to kill plants and people very effectively. As a result, I watched my great-grandmother die of cancer and many more people in my community died of cancer and many, many have a lot of sickness. The, we are at a pivotal point in our society where we can continue to utilize the industries that have polluted our community and made our population sick, or we forge a new path. And the way we do that is to have a just transition. 
you can only address climate change by addressing environmental justice and you have to deal with pollution. December 2019, I was the first candidate running for United States Senate to sign the Green New Deal pledge. Our current leadership has failed Tennessee in its regard and has sought to turn Tennessee into basically a garbage can for nuclear waste and waste from around the world. As a fighter for justice my entire life, my environmental plan for Tennessee is not just my environmental plan. This was a plan put together by listening to narratives to people across Tennessee to inform a platform based on people's ideas and how they want their community shaped. So supporting the Green New Deal and this initiative is to usher a new era of economic growth for Tennessee, investing heavily in infrastructure, jobs, and leaving our state a cleaner place for our children to explore. Infrastructure, as far as expanding broadband, renewing our energy infrastructure where it's renewable, clean, green energy, updating our sewage system. We have to look at how, even in my community growing up, everything, it was like a thriving community and then the divestment happened. When divestment happens like that over time, a loss of manufacturing jobs, then you have to answer that with a different way. These fence line polluted communities are the ones that bear the brunt of the loss of manufacturing jobs for over four dec decades. In order to deal with that, we need to retrofit those manufacturing um, plants and actually utilize them for some of the newer technologies that will save our communities. It's time to invest heavily in training, education, and career opportunities for professionals who are deeply needed in rapid change in environments, biologists, climatologists, renewable energy engineers, inventors, regenerative farmers, soil regeneration, and also looking to do a closed loop waste disposable and re-energy, re renewable energy finances. Federal oversight and audit of remediation in brownfields and super fund sites has been lacking because there's not enough funds to make sure it happens. And so we have to make sure that the remediation is paid by polluters and not just the buck passed on to taxpayers. We have to provide special facilities and treating environmental induced diseases. Our current healthcare system does not have the capacity to diagnose, treat acute and chronic exposure to certain types of chemicals. Areas with the worst environmental polluters also have the sickest populations and require healthcare facilities that recognize and specialize in treating environmental induced diseases, including lead exposure. And the reason why I bring up lead ex exposure is because we had several stories about lead being in our children's school. And if you know, if lead is in the schools, the houses were built around the same time. And so it's in our ho those houses and those businesses that were built around the same time. And right now, all the, the uh, technologies that people are using are very invasive and they're non-invasive technologies. And so that's just one example of being able to identify and, and treat an environmental induced disease um, from lead. Uh, as you know, it's no safe threshold for lead. And so we have to make sure that our population's water is safe to drink. I'm running for US Senate because people who look like me and overcome the same obstacles as I have deserve to have a leader in Washington DC who understands the issues and have lived experiences that's important to them. I'm running to represent all of Tennessee. My name is Marquita Bradshaw. I need you to go to the website, marquitabradshaw.com. And if you can right now, pull out your other device that you're not looking at this at and actually donate. And I think somebody will probably drop that in the, the chat real soon uh, where you can donate directly to the campaign because it takes dollars. We are trying to meet, reach as many young voters and bringing them into the process because this 
is their future and they should have a voice in in this political process and also have a leader that's going to listen in order to serve them. And if you um, have finished actually donating, I want you to go to the website, marquitabradshaw.com, scroll down to the bottom and sign up to volunteer because we are pushing out the most aggressive voter turnout program across Tennessee. We will have 10 functional offices real soon. And that includes the original home office that was actually in my house. Uh, we will have 10 offices across the state of Tennessee with coordinators and organizers um, getting out the vote to make sure that we reach every voter to make sure we are successful on November the 3rd. So Marquita Bradshaw will be your next United States Senator. Again, go to the website, marquitabradshaw.com, get involved and also donate. And there you can look around and you can see other issues that I support um, along with the Green New Deal, which are actually voices of Tennessee. Each sentence represent a narrative that I have come across in the state of Tennessee that has informed this platform of people's voices. So you see a people's mandate. So when I go to Washington, DC, I know exactly what I am to do because the people have shaped the in and informed this platform that's on MarquitaBradshaw.com. Thank you again. And my name is Marquita Bradshaw and I'm working hard to be your next United States Senator. Awesome. Thank you so much. I mean, you just really laid it all out so well, um, just exactly why we need you in office so desperately. And um, so I, I know you touched on a lot of these issues um, in, in everything that you just said, but specifically for Tennessee and especially relating back to, um, you know, your hometown in Memphis, how do you see a Green New Deal having an effect right here in Tennessee? Like what are some of the specific ways in which it'll help people in tangible ways right here at home? Look, it's all about building healthy and safe communities where people live, learn, work, worship, and recreate. And the Green New Deal is going to provide a just transition for these communities. That means we're going to transition away from the jobs that are forcing people to go to work, to put food on the table. That's not freedom when you have to right. go to work and pollute your community at the same time. And so as those industries are starting to phase out, those people need to be able to get those educational skills um, and they need to be able to do it uh, in a in a in the public educational system. So when I go to Washington, DC, I'm not just, uh, I understand how the educational platform ties in with the Green New Deal and expanding public education so people can get these new jobs that pay well and also rebuild their community. And so not only does that mean that everybody in Tennessee can turn on the tap water and have a drink of water and know it's safe. It means that when it comes to our waste delivery uh, systems, it don't just dump into the river, that we have a closed loop system and where we're using the, the better technologies instead of the old systems of the past. When it comes to our energy grid, updating it um, so we can have green renewable energy and not depend on um, people going to work, blowing off the top of the mountains. And these mountains are beautiful in, in East Tennessee. Um, or even um, dealing with coal ash in Memphis, Tennessee or East Tennessee. Um, just the, the, the devastation that coal ash causes communities. And so being able to, those same communities that are bearing the brunt of the, com of, of the pollution, it can also be a part of the solution and rebuilding their communities to look and shape as they wish. Right. That, I, I mean, <laughs> can't really get more specific than that. Those are all very real problems that we have right here at home that are affecting so many people and have been for a very long time because of these systemic issues. And I think that ties really well with um, the inequities that have been brought to light, or at least in even sharper focus because of coronavirus. And because that is disproportionately affecting folks who don't have the same resources as, um, you know, wealthy white people in this country. And so, I guess like tying it all together because, you know, Medicare for all, the Green New Deal, um, all of these issues are so deeply connected to each other. 
Can you tell us a little bit more about how you've seen the coronavirus affect people in your community and what you would do about that once you're elected? So before there was a pandemic with the coronavirus, there was a pandemic when it comes to poverty, and then there was a pandemic um, when it comes to pollution. And both of those are pre-existing conditions that people are living with all over Tennessee. So coronavirus on top of that affect communities that are around fence line um, pollution communities more so more so than ever because not number one, these communities are probably experiencing lack of health care or not quality health care. And if they do have access to health care, they can't actually physically pay for it without going bankrupt. Um, and so with all these factors, uh, people um, in Tennessee who are working class, when they get coronavirus, they don't experience it the same way as the president of the United States. He has the best staff, the best of everything and the best of health care. And we just want that for everybody, no matter who you are, how you got here, in order for all of us to get to the other side of coronavirus, we have to be able to have access to Medicare for all. If you want to, if you want to say, "Hey, uh, the uh, American Affordable Care Act," we know it's in its original form. It was a single payer system, and so let's not play games with what health care is and what health care what people need. And so when we look at what people need to get to the other side of pandemic, that is not a sick care system of what we have now where people are in, where the whole system is built on how sick people are. We need to move towards a system that's patient-centered and it's based on health outcomes and experiences of patients, of being healthy and well. And when we transition to that, then we will have the type of healthcare system that we need in, in this country. Right. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I, I think it can't really be put better than that. The profit motive is definitely something that's not something we should ever be mixing with, um, with healthcare and with so many other things. And um, on that kind of tied along with that, um, you know, just what types of system, how different systems affect different communities in different ways, which create and sustain inequity, essentially, um, what did what would working to defund the police once in Congress look like for you? And so I want to be very clear. When you look at our communities, certain communities have experienced divestment. And we have to re reimagine what public safety looks like. And what that looks like is that certain people have to be trained um, to deal with mental health issues, addiction support issues, and also interrupting the cycle of violence, whether it be domestic violence, whether it be gang violence or, or just escalating violence in certain neighborhoods. We have to have people who are trained that can go into those communities without guns to deal with those issues specifically. Now, I do believe that our police should be demilitarized. They should not be using the same weapons that you use to kill people in wars, period. And we need to make sure that there's training and we actually deal with the systemic racism that happens, um, not only in policing, but in our criminal and justice system. And once we actually address racism, not just in the criminal justice system, but throughout the fabric of America and actually put in punitive measures that when people are, are enforcing um, policy or enforcing laws in a way that they are targeting people based on their skin color, then we should have punitive me measures to discourage that. Because attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors will change once punitive measures are in place. Right, right. Yeah, definitely. There needs to be a lot of count accountability in the system that isn't there now. And um, in terms of the, you know, the funding that could be used elsewhere, um, in terms of, you know, that being some of that money being go 
being used um, to help with the Green New Deal for these other programs that would actually help, um, you know, preemptively prevent crime, I think, or is a huge part of the issue. I, I totally agree. And um, back to your environmental work, can you talk a little bit more about the work that you've done in the past with your environmental activism? I know you were with the Sierra Club for a long time and various other organizations. And I know that since we're all with Sunrise, we'd be really curious to hear how you got your start in environmental activism. So the, if like, it's like, let's go back like 25 years ago in 1995, uh, my mom had already started an organization called Defense Depot Memphis, Tennessee Concerned Citizens Committee. And to tell you the truth, we only did a little bit. We was like begrudgingly handing out flyers and on days that it was like hot as Hades outside. <laughs> um, and the day that we didn't want to do it because it was just really hot that day, it was like you really did feel like you were like next door to hell. It was so hot outside. It's like one of those Memphis summers that um, we were um, in the house. I was working on my paper and my sister and their friends uh, were talking about uh, being bummed out that one of our neighbors had uterine cancer. And this neighbor was either 13 or 14. I, you know, it's, it's a little bit back in time, but that's what, that wasn't an isolated case. So children from 13 to 18 were having reproductive cancers, uterine, ovarian, testicular, and prostate cancer. And when I stopped doing, I stopped working on my PR paper and came out and I was like, okay, what are we gonna do about it? And that's when we all co-founded Youth Terminating Pollution. And it was pretty revolutionary in this time for a youth group um, to be able to uh, sit on the actual board of the parent organization to be able to make decision and also lead and, and do their own actions and program work. And so we were like, so the Sunrise Movement is like a, a epitome of what we started in our house of, of uh, of children and, and myself, I was a little bit older um, and I was a mom, but it was it was pretty much children. Some of them were in elementary school, some were in middle school and some were in high school. And then it was me um, in college. And so that's how Youth Terminating Pollution started. And the type of work that we did was that we trained young people how to understand environmental policy and have conversations with federal agencies and elected officials to hold them accountable even if they weren't able to vote yet. And so what was so amazing is that they were able to negotiate how the Environmental Protection Agency should take soil samples and that set a standard on how they would take soil samples in our communities that uh, because of uh, most communities that are burdened with pollution don't have the ability to pay for soil sample. They were supposed to take uh, two soil samples. And so they st set a standard that if another group or someone wanted to come in and check behind the EPA, those soil samples were supposed to be preserved. And so that's what young people were able to negotiate. And that's the power of young people, even without voting. And so right now, um, uh, as you see, um, me, myself, I've always been an organizer and learning more and more tools and bringing people along that process to the point that I'm actually um, a U.S. Senate Democratic nominee. And we will win this U.S. Senate seat because we made Tennessee a battleground state. And it's, it was reaching out to young people, even in the primary, that actually helped us secure uh, the Democratic nomination, and that's what's going to help secure the general also. Yeah, I mean, that is truly incredible. Obviously, it was the um, the organizing that you started out doing was born out of, you know, horrible inequities, these things that were happening to children in your community. Um, 
But just the fact that you were able to harness the power of all these young people, like you, all of you together were able to harness this power and um, start creating real change. I mean, that speaks to exactly what you said. And um, it speaks to exactly what we do here at Sunrise. And that's why we resonate so deeply with your candidacy, with you and your background and the things that you're fighting for. And so I just, I really want to deeply thank you for that organizing that you know, we're, we're standing on the shoulders of giants here. And um, so we're, we're definitely standing on the shoulders of, of um, the work that you have done in the past, you and so many others. So, and you, you just touched on this. I wanted to hear a little bit more about how you were able to win the primaries. You said that it was help reaching out to young people. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. And um, just, yeah, how, are you, how you were able to secure this incredible, um, very exciting upset. And so I went about things a non-traditional way. I went for to reach out to people who were not organized in organizations um, because those are the hardest voters to reach. That And also do it in a way that's inviting people into the process to participate uh, for the first time where they are empowered and they take ownership of this process and know that, that this is not Marquita Bradshaw U.S. Senate seat, but I'm here to serve them. And that's what's been so powerful, um, bringing together working people um, and not just young people, but working people who um, have lost faith in the process to get involved for the very first time. And so that, that's the reason why they didn't see me coming because they only polled the traditional voters. Um, and so now we're in this space right now and we have an opportunity to continue to build on that foundation and now work those traditional organizations that, um, that have normally been able to get out the vote. And so now we have a strong foundation to not only win, but make Tennessee a battleground state to flip this U.S. Senate seat. So Marquita Bradshaw can be your next United States Senator. Yes, definitely. <laughs> um, I completely agree. There's so much untapped potential here in Tennessee. I mean, there are folks that are just disenfranchised um, that need to be brought back into the process, um, but also people that just don't, you know, feel that they've had a candidate that really speaks to them and they just, you know, are kind of like, um, just don't feel like they that participating in the system would really benefit them. But I think that your candidacy brings a lot of those folks back in, which is because it's, you know, truly something different and um, really truly substantive. Your candidacy is truly substantive. So I just can't thank you enough for that. And um, as, a, as a final question for you, what is the best way that we can get young people like myself and other folks, um, even younger who are in high school, middle school, et cetera, um, in just here in Tennessee or outside of Tennessee, just remotely, how can, how can we get folks to um, young people to remotely support your campaign? Well, if you have time to have a conversation, just ask them, how does federal policy shape their life? One question. And a lot of times, a, young, a lot of young people and a lot of adults, I'm not just going to say young people, a lot of people just don't know how much federal policy shape everything that we do. And once they understand the reach of federal policy and how our dollars that are uh, appropriated at the U.S. Senate level from our census, then they understand that they own the process at every level and that there's different ways to participate. And even if it's a person that hadn't got to voting age yet, there's still ways that they can actually uh, actually call bank, call, call from the couch, um, uh, text banking and phone banking. I say call bank. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> yeah, but so you can call from your couch um, and you can actually uh, text bank from the comfort of your home. Um, and for, for those who, of you who are of age, there are ways to get involved. We'll be doing leaflet drops and no contact canvassing. And we also do uh, social distancing events, wearing masks and taking safety precautions um, where people can still feel the momentum of the campaign and see 
all of the people that you are working with. And I think that's what's important about this whole campaign is the coalition building and how connected people are and that people understand that we are one Tennessee when it comes to addressing racism, when it comes to addressing pollution and actually rebuilding our communities um, that have been disenfranchised where everybody can have healthy and safe communities. Yeah. I mean, that really just brings it all together. Um, thank you so much. And that's all the questions that we have for today. And thank you so much to Marquita for joining us. It was so amazing to talk with you as always. And I, I don't know about all you who are watching, but I'm so hyped and ready to throw down for Marquita to do all that I can to help, which is why I'm going to be participating in the day of action that we have for her this Thursday, this Thursday, October 8th, we are going to try to make 20,000 calls for Marquita on Thursday. And I know that we can do it. I've been participating in these phone calls every week since we started them, these phone banks, and we run through the lists like nobody's business. So, but we need to, but we have a high goal this week. We've got 20,000 people to get through. So it's more than we've done before. Um, we need your help. And we're going to drop the link right now in the chat and, um, and on our social media pages. Um, but just in case the link is smvmt.org slash Marquita. And I really want to see all of you there. They're a lot of fun. We make them really interactive. It's a, it's a really good time. So I hope to see you all there. And thank you again, everyone for joining us, especially Marquita. And let's go win a Green New Deal here in Tennessee and nationwide and get Marquita elected. Bye. Thank you.